Hello, welcome. I am Jeff Colgan, a professor here at the Watson Institute of um, International and Public Affairs and director of the new Climate Solutions Lab uh, that started this year to help uh, identify solutions to climate change, the, the world's uh, most important global challenge. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome uh, two guests uh, and uh, a long-term uh, a friend um, as discussant. So we have Danny Cullen Ward uh, and David Victor, who have uh, just written this uh, fantastic new book, uh, which I have a copy of right here in front of me, and it is already uh, getting well thumbed, um, which is uh, a testament to its quality because I'm at the stage of my career where I don't get to read entire books uh, very often. I usually only read pieces of them. Uh, and so uh, it is uh, a real pleasure to have them here to help. Uh, us think through this incredibly difficult problem where, uh, especially now in the last 12 months, we've seen all kinds of interest and ideas for how to address this problem come out. Uh, and we probably have more ideas on the table uh, than uh, are, are, are necessarily most effective. So let me just introduce uh, each of our speakers. Uh, and then uh, what I'll do is ask uh, Danny and David to talk for just about 10 minutes uh, about the, their book and introduce us to its main ideas. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Amanda Lynch uh, to serve as discussant, uh, ask a few questions and just draw out uh, some more of those ideas. Uh, and then we're gonna open it up to uh, all of you. And so we're gonna use uh, the Q and A um, uh, function uh, in the, the webinar, uh, not the chat function. So the Q and A button down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you want at any point, uh, in, insert your questions when they occur to you uh, and we'll try to draw them out and use them for conversation for the, the last 30 minutes of our, uh, our event today. And if you're watching by YouTube, you are able to insert questions as well uh, in the comments uh, on, on the website. And uh, we have someone who will uh, pick those comments up and, and, and transport them into the webinar. So by all means, participate that way. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Danny Cullen Ward, uh, who is an energy economist and lawyer. Uh, he serves as, an, as a lecturer at Stanford uh, Law School and is also the, the policy director at Carbon Plan. His co-author, David Victor, uh, is uh, a long-term friend of mine as well, uh, is a professor at University of California, San Diego in the policy school there, uh, and also at, at the Scripps Institute of Oceano uh, Oceanography. Uh, and then Amanda Lynch uh, is here at Brown University. Uh, she is the Sloan Linderman and George Linderman Jr. Distinguished Professor of uh, Environmental Studies. Uh, and was previously the director of uh, IBIS, the Institute at Brown for Environment uh, and Society. So without any further ado, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Danny and David. Excellent, thank you very much, Jeff and, and Amanda, and really terrific to be here with you and also to be part of the early events for your lab and also to connect to IBIS again. It's really, really a great pleasure. So Danny and I are gonna take about 10 minutes and talk about the motivation for the book and some of the highlights and, um, and then turn it, back, turn it back to you. And I'm gonna start by, by first talking about why we wrote this book. Um, Danny and I have been collaborating for a long, long time on a variety of things. And sitting in the back, a lot of that collaboration has been the question of which policy instruments actually get things done. You know, the climate problem, this, we've been through this, uh, this wrenching experience this year where emissions went down temporarily, temporarily, now they're kind of on their way back, on their way back up. All kinds of talk about building back better, some doing, the ratio of talking to doing is very high. And one of the areas where, where the ratio of talking to, to action has been particularly high has been around the use of market-based instruments. And that's what this book is about. We finished this book long before the US election. But when we finished it, uh, it was already clear, exactly as you said, Jeff, that a lot of facts on the ground were changing. There's a lot of new momentum, mainly out of Europe. The Europeans have become the reliable leaders in this area. But not only in Europe, parts of the United States, Japan, Korea, uh, China, now net zero by 2060, and building that in various ways into the, the, the planning system, uh, with a few hiccups here and there. And so when you kind of take, take a step back, there's all kinds of action. And that action seems to be correlated with the use of market-based instruments. The World Bank runs these uh, uh, annual survey looking at carbon pricing. Uh, and, and there's been a big rise in the fraction of global emissions that are, that are 
in places that, that have market-based instruments, cap and trade systems, the quantity measure, or tax systems, carbon tax systems, mostly cap and trade systems. That's been the bulk of the experience. I think we understand why that is. It's easier for a lot of jurisdictions to pass cap and trade systems than it is to pass tax systems. Um, but there's been all this experience and it seems to be rising and it seems to correlate with, with um, more serious action on the ground to address the climate change problem. And so we've been over the years talking about whether that's, you know, that, that, that's causal. Is, uh, our, is the action we're seeing around the use of markets actually changing facts on the ground? And we were, we anecdotally knew the answer mostly was, was no. That anecdotally, most of the most of the policies that are really moving the needle are policies that are classic regulatory policies, industrial policy, variety of other things, and whereas the market-based system seem to be kind of faking it, as it were. And um, we now have enough experience to be able to look at that question systematically. That's what we try and do in this book. The book's highly empirical. Uh, its contribution is. Uh, a look empirically at all the major uh, market-based systems around the world, but also to add a theory to explain why we observe what we observe. And the theory has, in a kind of classic political economy sense, has a handful of organized interest groups and institutions. Uh, and in particular, the organized interest groups that really matter are incumbents, um, the public, when the public notices the cost of various kinds of policy and instruments and elected officials who are leaders and have entrepreneurial ideas about the use of different kinds of, uh, different kinds of market instruments. And so what's interesting to us is there's a lot of pressure on leaders to adopt market-based instruments, partly to create the illusion that they're using a flexible market to keep costs low, but in tandem with that, they're using all kinds of other policy instruments to control, to control emissions. And one of the questions we, that we grapple with in the book is whether, whether that's true because all these politicians were kind of asleep in Economics 101 when they learned about externalities, and had they only been more awake and taken better notes and so on, they'd, they'd be using market instruments in a better way. And our argument is no, they were wide awake and they, they heard what they heard and they were horrified by it because almost everything that we like as analysts about markets and both Danny and I are trained in that tradition of using market instruments where possible to control, to deal with externalities, almost everything we like about those, for example, fungibility across different sectors, transparency, flexibility, and so on, is kind of a horror show to politicians whose job in some sense is to manage the incidence of costs and benefits on different well-organized interest groups that uh, that can demand for and sometimes extract um, uh, um, uh, political political response. And so that's the theme that runs through the whole book. There's a lot of extensions to that theme. Let me just talk about one, which is this observation we make early on in the book about what are called what we call Potemkin markets. That when you have a cap and trade system that operates alongside a bunch of regulations. And the regulations are politically designed to do most of the work and frankly to hide and shift the costs in various ways. And often they're very costly and also very effective. Those regulations in effect lower emissions and then the cap and trade system which sits on top of that trades the residual, trades what's left over. And so it's trading in effect something that cost a lot more to obtain the emission reduction but the market is clearing at prices that are dramatically lower than the real cost of, mar of, of, margin, of marginal effort. So we call these Potemkin markets because they're a little bit like the fable of Potemkin villages where you take the czar out, you say, hey, look at this great thing that we built here. But when you look behind the facade, what's really doing the work is regulation. And if, to the extent that you really, one takes that seriously, and this is an argument that's, that's a stronger critique of cap and trade than of, than of carbon taxes, uh, you take that argument seriously, then if we really want to push the technological frontier, we have to do more with smart regulation and industrial policy and use markets where they are capable, but not expect them to do the real heavy lifting of, of deep decarbonization. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Danny, who's going to talk a little more about how our framework gets, gets used, and then we'll turn it back to you. So thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks for the chance to be here. So I want to pick up on just a couple of themes to, to sort of kick off this discussion. Um, one of the things we're trying to do in the book is not just make an argument about some of these big picture strategies, although we have that too, but it's to lay out a, a concrete and testable theory, a framework for thinking about these political issues that help us organize our thoughts and, and get a little bit more concrete about not just what we think works, but why, and then how to think about that strategically going forward. And one of the key contributions we try to make is to think more comprehensively about the role of sectoral coverage. So you often hear if we just put a price on carbon on as much of the emissions we have as possible, that'll be the most efficient and quickest way to get things done. And we come to almost the opposite conclusion in the book. 
uh, and this is a really important point uh, politically, the more sectors you have involved in a carbon pricing program, actually the more difficult it is to negotiate over what the price should be. If you have a market or you have a uniform carbon tax, you're gonna set the same price level essentially for all of the players. Yet all of the players have radically different opportunities to change their emissions, constraints, and political power to fight back. And so we often see in multi-sector programs, which textbook Econ 101 would say, broaden that coverage, bring in as many sectors as possible under the carbon pricing regime, I think we also see pretty comprehensive evidence that you get lowest common denominator politics, where the challenges of the most politically organized sector, um, whether those are political or technological or economic, end up dominating the macro system and sort of lowering the overall ambition that's possible in a multi-sector program. And to give you a sense of what this looks like, we think about three sectors in the book in detail. One is the electricity sector, which is obviously one of the key areas where we have a ton of momentum right now in terms of what's technologically possible. We have the broad industrial sector, by which we mean everything from refined oil products to steel and iron and cement. These are highly concentrated, often very trade exposed, often global commodity industries. And we have transportation fuels, which are arguably the most politically sensitive um, uh, sectors for politicians in many countries. Each of these sectors has its own distinct opportunities and challenges. Um, and I think it's, it's worth mentioning, we are not anti-markets in the book. In fact, we point out that carbon prices have actually had some effect in electricity sectors where they've been applied. Uh, my two favorite examples, the UK used a very aggressive carbon price floor in its uh, participation in the European cap and trade program to help transition off of coal onto natural gas and to some extent pushing into renewables as well. We see similar activities in places like Alberta. Um, but we have, I think, a very different set of challenges when it comes to industry. When it comes to industry, a carbon price is a policy mechanism that creates competitiveness impacts. And it's very difficult to solve that problem when we walk through in the book how uh, often industrial sectors, when they're covered, many of the industries get large exemptions and the exemptions sometimes get sort of bigger and broader than economists would say would be well targeted to address the trade exposure problem. And everybody just sort of invokes the idea that we're gonna figure out how to do border carbon adjustments eventually to figure out how to integrate these trade impacts. And we talk quite a bit about how that's actually quite challenging to do, particularly if you take our primary thesis seriously, which is that a lot of the work is regulatory and opaque in nature, which means it's very difficult to harmonize and equilibrate different sectors and competitiveness forces. Uh, a second sector, just to give another highlight of how thinking about sectors can help you identify the constituencies and political problems that make life difficult. The transportation sector is, um, arguably one of the toughest sectors to deal with because when you cover transportation fuels in a carbon pricing program, you create very visible and direct impacts on the price of gasoline. And I think a lot of academics who worked in policy when they have their first major policy advising experience and they say, here's the policy I recommend to a politician. One of the first questions a politician asks is what's that gonna do to the price of gasoline? And there's this moment, I think for, I know I had this myself and I've had many other friends who've gone through this where you realize that's how a lot of people think about this stuff because typical voters know the price of gasoline down to the decimal point. Nobody knows what their electricity bill looks like. That's not to say unfair or hidden costs in the electricity sector are okay, but it is a practical reality about the way political systems respond to different incidences and sectoral coverages. So these challenges mean you can easily get stuck when you have multi-sector programs. And to make a long story short, Europe, which has the most ambitious and successful carbon pricing program in the world, um, we are seeing prices right now uh, edge up towards 50 US dollars per ton or higher uh, right now in the European markets. They're on a big bull run. The big problem they're dealing with is what does this mean for our trade exposed industrial sector, which along with electricity is part of that program. Europe has to solve that problem to push its ambition with that instrument farther. California is another great example. It's actually gotten stuck in a much lower gear because California includes uh, the transportation fuel sector in its cap and trade program. And that means any effort to make the program function well makes it really easy to write attack ads. And that is a problem Europe doesn't have to deal with. It's a problem that sectoral individual sector programs that don't touch transportation are able to avoid as well. Maybe the last uh, thing to mention um, is that uh, we talk quite a bit in the book about carbon offsets, and that's a topic that may be relevant for our discussion as we're seeing more countries pledge net zero climate ambitions, and we're seeing a lot of corporations step up to do the same. Um, offsets and compliance markets, that is to say where they are used to help comply with cap and trade or, car or uh, carbon tax programs, the experience has been almost abysmal uh, across the board. And we spend quite a bit of time thinking about this in the book. Um, 
the short story is that the buyers in these programs, they want high quantities of low cost offsets to help keep the cost down. The point of offsets in these compliance markets is to lower the cost of compliance um, for the incumbent industries. Uh, and we often see, frankly, some groups, some NGOs, including environmental NGOs, get involved in the offsets game to try and redirect the flow of revenue as oil companies end up paying for purported forest conservation efforts. If you're in the forest conservation business, you might see an incentive to try and come in there and direct that flow of money. We don't see a lot of incentive or a lot of groups who are focused primarily on quality. Almost all of the players are focused on volume and cheap prices, and that is where we see almost universally bad outcomes in practice. This is relevant because now that we're seeing this sort of broader discussion around net zero, there's a lot of thinking about offsets and things that look exactly like carbon offsets. And it's really important for people to know the contemporary offsets industry is born of these compliance markets and these major structural political flaws that birthed them with a sort of original sin where nobody has any idea what's going on and quality is almost the last thing on everybody's mind. Um, so just to back up, I'll, I'll say sort of one last thing and, and look forward to the discussion. Um, we try to spend some time in the book thinking about how using our political model, we're gonna make some suggestions about how to improve these programs and also spend some time thinking about what smart regulation and industrial policy should look like uh, if we're correct that these kinds of instruments are unlikely to be the primary source of climate policy progress going forward. Um, so let me pause there uh, and thank you again for the chance to join you all today. Terrific, thanks so much. Uh, Amanda, do you wanna uh, take things from here? Oh, you're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> um, so thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed reading this book and I can't really wave it around because it's actually on my Kindle. Um, so, but, um, but there it is. The, the nice thing about that is that I could annotate it without defacing the pages, but it's, it's um, yeah, I recommend it. It's, it's uh, such an interesting read and such a fresh, look at all of these assumptions we've been making about how this is going to work and um and i think that you know that that kick was, was sorely needed um so what i thought i would do is perhaps start things off by asking a few questions to to invite david and danny to um to delve into some of these issues a little bit more deeply and then we'll open it up um, moderated by jeff um, to questions from the audience so um, the, the first one I'll start with is we've known and written for a long time that framing human caused climate change as irreducibly global has failed us. Um, and that was probably for, done first by scientists like me, climate scientists, because the physics of the effect is irreducibly global that somehow the policy had to kind of fall over and, and follow. So I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Um, your case against cap and trade on those grounds, specifically our inability to stitch together carbon markets to yield a less volatile, less pro-cyclical and more effective price is really compelling. I was wondering if you could talk more about the ways in which other in market instruments, uh, specifically carbon taxes and tariffs, if they're not applied uniformly, will they similarly yield poor outcomes and, and um, talk a bit more about the reasons for that. Yeah, so um, thank you for that. Um, I think we've all learned a lot about the framing issue. And I think it's because we often be, we started, you know, thinking back to the Stone Age when a lot of these debates began in the early 1990s. We started about thinking about this as a global problem and globally optimal solutions and so on. And it's actually to me astonishing how long we political scientists, frankly, allowed that to go on. And that's partly because, and Jeff knows this well, because he's been part of a well-organized group of younger scholars that are getting serious about the politics of climate change. And the whole discipline has frankly been too slow to get serious about, about this. And as you, we brought in political scientists and sociologists and psychologists, we've realized these framings really, really matter. Um, I wanna talk about one aspect of the framing though that I think really matters and it goes directly to your question, which is about whether the arguments we're using around cap and trade apply equally to carbon taxes. And in part they do in the sense that the political sensitivity around visible prices in some sectors, and as Danny said, transportation sector is exhibit A for that, that visible sensitivity is there regardless of the instrument, that, to first order regardless of the instrument that's used. And so all that tells us 
that we're unlikely to see the kinds of high prices that you need to really induce profound technological change. Those, that's gonna, not gonna come out of market-based instruments. It's gonna come out of other kinds of policy instruments. And one of the interesting tests of that theory is Norway, which has one of the highest carbon prices in the world. And yet, even under that high carbon price environment, Equinor, the state oil company, what's well, not a state energy company now, they've changed their name from state oil to Equinor. Nobody knows what Equinor means, but it's, it sounds nice. And Equinor, along with Total and Shell, are doing this Northern Lights project, this carbon capture and storage project, where they're collecting CO2 from around the North Sea, liquefying it, putting it on ships, and then taking it to Norway and injecting it underground. Um, those of you who like the movie, the, the Netflix series Occupied should, should also learn about uh, uh, Northern Lights. That's the most innovative CCS project in the world today. And they could not justify doing that project, doing what's called FID, closing financial on that beginning construction, which they did in January. They could not justify that on the carbon price alone. They had to go back to the state in effect for industrial policy in the EU and in Norway. And so there's all these interesting examples where pushing the technological frontier requires policy instruments beyond that. The one area where, as a general rule though, we have a whole chapter in the book, chapter seven, which is about making better use of market instruments. And a big chunk of that chapter is about using taxes more than cap and trade systems. And if you've got a cap and trade system, putting in price floors and ceilings and, and uh, volume reserves, which is what the EU has been doing, to take a cap and trade system and turn it into more of a price-like mechanism. And a big chunk of that is that logic is because the price effects interact more nicely with existing regulations at the margin the price signal that comes from from a uh, from a carbon tax uh, still works on firms uh, unlike in the cap and trade system which they all turn into potemkin markets thanks thanks very much so going kind of expanding on this issue of of you know uh following the money um, so you've noted uh, that one of the most ignored benefits of any market schemes is their capacity to raise revenue. Um, and that's often been characterized as a way to channel resources into public sectors that could contribute to deep carbonization like Northern Lights. Um, and indeed, that, that capacity to generate revenue uh, can help make the whole decarbonization project more politically palatable than the regulatory approach, which is, as you argue, and I agree, more effective in most cases. So what are your thoughts on decoupling the promise of revenue generation and the market approach in the political discourse? You know, how, how do you kind of get, get, get people off that teat, basically? So I think we kind of lean into sort of the, the opposite framing, which is that that is the, the, the lens through which to organize the politics to sustain market-based instruments where people want to apply them. Their primary effect, because of all of these compounding political problems, is they tend to have prices that are lower than what we need. But a price is better than no price. So making that price more effective, the more price-like the instrument is, the more it's either a tax or one of these hybridized cap-and-trade programs, the more that market-based instrument will play better with the regulatory standards that are doing a lot of the work. But then what you have is a program that potentially generates a significant amount of revenue. And I, I think it's actually kind of the opposite situation. It's the political rhetoric around the programs being primarily about setting the right price or the right cap, which for all the reasons in the book tends not to work out very well. It's not about money. This isn't a giant taxation scheme. That's what everybody says to characterize these as environmental programs and help get them across the political finish line. And one of the results of that is that there's almost no clear information about how effectively the revenues in these programs are being spent. Um, and that's a real challenge, both because there are frankly political deals that need to get made to sustain any serious instrument, including market-based instruments. And we try in the book to be realistic about the need for those kinds of political deals involving revenue. The problem is that everybody says they're spending the revenue on climate measures. And as we all know, climate touches everything. So it's very easy to characterize anything as a climate measure. And because we have this sort of hands-off critical distance on the spending side, anything goes. Uh, and we think that's a lost opportunity to basically make more politically efficient the side deals that are needed to accommodate and sus sustain political regimes, as well as to harness some of those resources in really serious ways for the global public good. We talk a lot about, there's some great sort of theory papers over the last five or seven years 
that talk about the ability of using carbon pricing to accelerate regulations and then that progress to accelerate carbon pricing, there's basically no empirical analysis of how that connection functions. And we think in practice, it's quite a bit messier than theorists have characterized it. It's an area where we recommend people spend more time to try and get the incentives right. Right, that's that's really helpful. So, so again, continuing down this track, so uh, getting to this idea of industrial policy, um, one of the things that um, uh, immediately came up for me is that in Australia, there's an often used derogatory uh, synonym for industrial policy, which is picking winners. Um, and, uh, um, and it's considered to be a politically dangerous strategy um, in any domain, um, uh, climate change notwithstanding. Um, certainly in this country, um, that, that idea of industrial policy has a certain amount of kind of political toxicity because in, inevitably some recipient industries and firms will fail. Um, and, uh, and there is this idea that, um, uh, um, that, that um, you know, punishing failure is something that the electorate does extremely well. So uh, we saw this with Solyndra, for example, it was a renewables com company that got uh, money from the Obama administration and then failed. Um, so can you say more about how we, how we can um, address this problem? Um, since we understand that failure is inevitable and even appropriate, um, if we're going to be transforming the economy, if we're going to get it wrong. So how do, how do we go through this process? Yeah, so it's, it's exactly the right question, because the more pessimistic one is that you can design the markets, a market-based strategy to solve the problem and then stand back and voila, the problem solves itself through the, through the miracles of the market, the more you have to talk about the alternatives. And so chapter seven in our book is about how to make better use of markets and chapter eight of the book is about how to, um, how to go beyond the markets and develop, um, call it industrial policy, regulatory strategies and so on. There's a, there's a lot of kind of emotion in the language and that's true in the Australian debate, that's true in the American debate. And we, we, get, we, we get that, but it's unavoidable that one has to talk about the quality of government and the capacity of government to intervene in, in markets to help push the technological frontier. Almost always, this is not done by government alone. This is done by governments and firms engaged in joint search. There's a lot has been learned about when and how that's, that, that's effective. We talk about that in, in the book to, to, some, to, in, in, to some detail. I think what's interesting to me as a political scientist looking at this is that there are actually a lot of good models for how the government can be effective. So take the, the loan program, which is the Solyndra case there. Um, we understand why politicians focus on the fire alarm of Solyndra. It certainly didn't help that the president showed up at Solyndra not long before the company imploded. So you got all the right photo ops um, that are good for the opposition. But when you take a step back and look at the performance of the program overall, the performance is actually extraordinary, um, the loan guarantee program. And the same is true for earlier stage. That's a later stage where you've got technologies that need demos and support for lowering the cost of capital when you're doing a large scale demo project in the earlier stage. Take ARPA-E, uh, department, also Department of Energy program, highly effective, extensive reviews have been done on that. So there's a playbook that has emerged around how government can be effective and not build the kind of white elephants in the desert of before or in the, the title of the, um, of the most famous book, early book on this, uh, uh, Pork Barrel um, uh, Projects. Sure, some of that happens. But I think actually the overall story is, story is much, much more encouraging. I'm on a National Academy of Sciences panel that just reported out about two weeks ago on the future of the electric power grid. And we rep recommend at least a doubling of early stage investment in there and also outline what that playbook looks like. So I think we've actually learned a lot in this country. The Europeans have learned a lot. And it's a lot of governments have learned how to, how to do that more effectively. The last thing I'll say briefly about this is this is an area where the politics have really drifted off. And one of the reasons we wrote this book is to help provide some signposts because the left has been to this, uh, um, Danny and I have some different politics, the left has kind of come to this earlier than the kind of center right and their right, they're absolutely correct. 
But the left has come to this without really paying attention closely to what are the skills you need in government and how do we articulate those and make that happen. And the right um, uh, has come to this issue and just instinctively said, you know, government can't get anything done. And they're just a bunch of dudes sitting around drinking Mai Tais all day long and not, not intervening effectively. It's so and all over the place. And that's just completely wrong. And so what we're trying to do is help talk to the parts on both on, on the across the spectrum that that are interested in what the actual solutions are and the solutions have to involve a bigger role for for, for government and frankly as somebody who's a who's a centrist um, the centrists people like me have been way too slow to recognize how the left frankly the progressive part of the of the democratic party certainly has been on that faster and earlier than the centrists have been just really briefly to add, I think one of the best contemporary uh, lessons to draw is actually watching the Biden administration and the vaccine rollout. I mean, I think what you're seeing right here where there is a coordinated industrial government procurement partnership, that is essentially the kind of thing we are trying to articulate with respect to the climate problem in the book. And I think it's no accident that you see that level of government intervention to try and scale up basically the rollout of a mass vaccination. It's a very similar kind of a problem. And I think that that partnership where there's a state leadership role is the part that's been missing from the climate conversation. We just assume there'll be a carbon price and government steps back. That's not been working, but you have to do the government intervention part well, and you can't make any excuses about the failures in that world when they do happen. Right. Yeah. And I think the analogy as well with with ARPA -E and, and, you know, those those early developments and that tolerance for failure within that process um, gave us a, a lot of what we consider to be normal today in terms of our um, electronic and connectivity um, innovation. So, you know, that's a nice analogy as well. So, so getting then to that kind of geeky question, um, you know, we're, we're at a university and so our, our, our industry is, um, is training these, these politicians and decision makers and corporate leaders of the future. So, um, so this is the geeky kind of poli sci question. So experimentalist governance that you allude to in the book, and, and I know there's a book coming, um, seems to build on earlier forays into these ideas that have not quite kind of gotten the traction. And, and I certainly appreciate this idea of kind of recognizing the way uh, the polit across the political spectrum, you have um, people who've gotten parts of the issue right and never put the whole thing together. Um, so you've got these ideas like adaptive governance and deliberative democracy and network governments and even social learning and all of these kind of different things. Um, and so what are your thoughts on getting to implementation in this, uh, in this kind of centrist space in the face of incumbent policy practitioners, business people, elected decision makers who are trained on, on earlier models um, that have, we've demonstrated have not worked? I guess I think both of us probably say something about this, but um, I think it's I mean, we're optimistic that by articulating actual strategies, we can make progress and hopefully progress faster than than a lot of academic progress, which occurs one funeral at a time. Um, but it does require articulating a set of ideas. And this book is not designed to be, you know, the last word on the politics of markets. It's, it's designed to be a framing with a clear theory, clear empirics and then inviting other people to, to challenge that. And we need to do more of that. We need to treat the politics of instrument choice as a, as a, as a field of science and lay out what our predictions are and test them and um, invite others to do this in other ways. And so that's the dialogue we're trying to have. It's it running in parallel with a, this effort as I mentioned earlier for political scientists to get more, uh, more, more heavily involved here. I think part of this, um, I, I'm actually pretty encouraged here and I'll just say two things about this and then turn it to Danny. One, one is, I think more people recognize that the climate problem is really in some sense two fundamental challenges. One challenge is creating incentives for, for firms to adopt technologies that we already know about um, and business models we already know about. That's an area where markets perform very well if they're well designed because they help static optimization. The other challenge which is the bigger challenge the more profound one is really pushing the technological frontier. And I think part of the confusion about when and how markets work has been a confusion about the politics of these multi-sector markets and so on, and also, frankly, the politics of which instrument works under which circumstances. 
and half or more of the technologies we need don't exist. And so I see the, the core challenge here as, as one of pushing the technological frontier. I think there's actually been a lot of progress made there. You see more, including the UK government, the way they're hosting COP26 with these campaigns where they're recognizing that we need to work in smaller groups with industrial policy, with, with firms and governments working together to push technological frontiers in light duty vehicles and in, in, in um, uh, electric power and a handful of other sectors. And that's the way of progress. And that's a view that we articulate as well uh, in, in the book. Just echo, I, I think it's it's really, you know, testing and talking about this stuff openly. So just double down on that. Last thing to say on this is I spend in my day job a lot of time working with people who are trying to push the technological frontier on technologies like direct air capture, for example. And I actually think that there isn't a lot of confusion in those technological frontier worlds because they understand that market-based policy instruments are not reliable ways to do project finance for risky technologies. I think everybody involved in the practical and business side of this actually it has a very direct intuitive understanding of these challenges. We haven't connected those conversations or started to make systematic a thought process and research agenda that helps push things forward. So we hope the book is a way to frame that and to begin that conversation rather than as David said, the final answer in a cookbook for everybody. Great, thank you. Well, I'll hand over to Jeff. I know he has uh, a question or two. Terrific, uh, thanks so much for, for uh, setting the table for us. And we're already starting to see um, some questions come in on the Q&A, and so I'm going to turn to those uh, very shortly. And so I, I want to invite everyone who's watching uh, to participate by uh, asking questions that way. Uh, but I will uh, be selfish and, uh, and ask my own question first. Uh, and uh, I, I've already, uh, you know, pinged these guys a little bit on, on this question already, but I want to come back to this notion of, of carbon tariffs, which uh, David mentioned earlier about the EU kind of needing to do as, as it's uh, carbon price rises, and that creates a problem for some of its industries, particularly steel and, and uh, glass manufacturing, that kind of thing. And so, uh, on one uh, level, you know, for for Europe, how they need to do carbon tariffs, but how, given uh, the the WTO uh, regulations, of course, it, it runs headlong into the WTO uh, rules, and even more so for the U.S. And maybe Danny, you you want to take this. Um, you know how should how should the U.S. is talking? Biden is talking about carbon tariffs here in the United States, but we don't even have a carbon price, uh, which is you know a carbon tariff is supposed to equal uh, the 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 carbon domestic carbon price. So how does that work? Does it make sense to use carbon tariffs for the United States? Uh, and does a a climate club of the kind of thing that that um, you know, the, the Nobel laureate uh, Nordhaus has been talking about with a, a global climate club, or at least a, a large emitter climate club. Does that make sense if the politics uh, prevent a, a carbon price at the domestic level? Uh, so, so David and, and then Danny, if you want to take a crack at that. Okay, so a um, lot going on there and very important topic. I think the US, um, may not be fully aware that the Europeans intend to use their carbon, their border measures against us. <laughs> it's an area where we're going to have a lot in common with the Chinese um, who are terrified about this. Um, I think a lot of this is workable. Border measures with regulatory instruments is workable in the sense that the trade community has been working on similar problems and they dealt with it through tarification and a variety of other instruments and so on. The key is to be non-discriminatory and you know, meet all the other standards of WTO compliance. If, if you know I mean, anybody cares about WTO compliance the, these days. To me, I, I think the big issue here is the difference between threatening tariffs as a way to motivating action and actually applying them. And almost all the action we've seen so far has been of the one senior European diplomat described it to me as uh, negotiating with a loaded gun on the table. So you kind of don't want the gun to go off, but you want to show that you're credible. And that's why we're seeing more action in airlines. A lot of it, unfortunately, is in the offsets type, but you're seeing a, you're seeing a lot of firms motivated by, by threats and concern about loss of market access, as opposed to real application of these border measures. But we will soon be at the point of real application of border measures. And I, I think that's doable in a regulatory world, but it's a whole lot more complicated, as Danny says, than, than just looking at the posted price of carbon and then making an adjustment at the border and then sitting back and watching the miracle of the market take place. Great. Yeah, I mean, you have Indian, you know, industrial conglomerates, Chinese state run corporations and American and European firms that respond to non price policies that drive a lot of their private incentives and 
there isn't a single number that connects all those things together. So I think when if we get to the application stage, it's a huge mistake to look at the carbon price as the sort of posted, you know, border measure. It's a much more complicated problem and it is what holds ambition in the industrial sector back. So we have to figure out a way forward on that. Great. Um, well, I'm going to turn now to the some of the questions we're getting in from the, the Q&A and I'll, I'll sort of read them uh, out uh, to folks. I'm going to start with a question from Kelly Raymond, uh, who is uh, a wonderful student uh, here at Brown. I've had the pleasure of teaching her uh, and she asks, do you think the multi-sectoral issues with carbon pricing are a main reason why major oil and gas companies and most recently the American Petroleum Institute support carbon pricing? Uh, or is there something else driving their support? their support. Uh, David may want to weigh in. David uh, spent a lot of time with these kinds of questions, but uh, I'll throw out something somewhat provocative. I think this is round two of the oil industry's anti-climate playbook. I think round one was the successful deployment of a cap and trade program in California that is stuck at $18 a ton. And the legislative trade to get that involved rolling back direct regulatory authority on the oil and gas industry, which in California is very large in both production and refining sectors. And that was possible because oil knew that if they did this, everybody would clap for an economy-wide carbon price, but then they could on implementation threaten major attack ads against basically every elected official and keep the price at a level that doesn't affect their business operations. So I think you have a very similar dynamic going into the negotiating position in Washington, DC. Um, the other main issue, uh, I think it's worth pointing out, groups like API haven't actually been very specific about what they want. Um, where is that price going to be set? If we set it at a level that my friends in the economics community tell me is their current estimate of the social cost of carbon, it's going to change business. If it's set at 20 or 30 or 40 or $50 a ton, it's not going to fundamentally alter the oil and gas industry. So that's an issue. Second big issue is that the oil industry's negotiating position always involves regulatory rollbacks. So we'll support a carbon price in exchange for taking something else away. And we don't know what that something else really is in these conversations. And that is the other major variable to look for. What price are you going to get? Is it going to make a difference? And what tools will you lose uh, from that industry's position to get that price? And I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors right now in that conversation. Uh, as much as I am somebody who would like to see all of these efforts plus a carbon tax, that would be the best outcome. Make sure you get what you pay for. I would say very briefly, API is living in the political stone age. Um, it's, um, it's hard to organize that industry because you got small companies and big companies. You got some big companies that don't want to do anything, although they're being hammered hard into pretending to do something and eventually probably will do something more. Um, uh, full disclosure, I've been involved with engine number one on the Exxon uh, initiatives, um, which have seemed to be having an impact. Um, I think it's mostly disingenuous because they the package is the rollbacks along with an unspecified carbon tax. They know there's no chance that that's actually gonna work. As a political scientist, what I see is huge variation in firm behavior a lot of talking, some doing, and that's called data. And so we ought to be doing more work to study that variation in industrial behavior and the interaction between the, the industrial um, operations and regulation, because that is core to the field of industrial organization. And I don't, practically nobody's actually looking at it. It's kind of astonishing. Terrific, thank you. I uh, just say uh, uh, one anecdote. I remember being uh, at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. on a, a sabbatical year quite a few years ago now when then CEO of ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson, later Secretary of State, announced Exxon would suddenly uh, support a carbon tax. Uh, and he did this precisely at the moment when cap and trade was starting to gain some traction in DC. And so it's hard not to be a little bit cynical uh, about the, the motivations of at least some of the firms. Um, I'm going to um, jump around a little bit on the questions here, but I want to take one from uh, Professor Mark Blythe uh, here at, uh, at the Watson Institute. Um, he says, thanks for the discussion. I will be sure to buy the book. I hear a lot about learning firms and tech. I do not hear much about labor. The one thing the market uh, and tech focus tends to dodge is that for a transition to happen, it's not just uh, the, the costs uh, of the transition for business that matters, it's also labor. Uh, and so I wonder if you could uh, help us think through that, that, that topic as well. So that's a topic we didn't address in detail in the book, and I think it's one of the natural extensions. We think you can explain almost all of the macro patterns with the, the limits of carbon pricing without a significant role for organized labor in that 
explanatory package. Um, but I could say I spent an enormous part of my, my sort of typical work day working in California policy where the number one most important question I think is how labor politics align with these overall industrialization policies. So um, you see many examples where if you look at the history of, for example, California's clean electricity laws, which have been phenomenally successful, that's been a partnership with labor where the idea is construction is gonna to lead to union jobs. You see this important alignment between uh, unionized labor and clean energy and environmental outcomes in some of those direct regulatory measures. More recently, you see some of those same labor groups affiliate more with the incumbent industries. For example, if you know the, the, the pipe fitters and other important parts of the building and trades union, they see the oil and gas industry as one of the primary ways that a person without a college degree can make a, a living and lead a decent life. And that is in a, that's just the factual statement right now in huge parts of the state of California. So we, we allude a little bit in the book toward the end about whether you can align labor or labor becomes an opponent of some of these climate policy changes is a critical variable for thinking about a lot of these issues, particularly when you go sector by sector. Um, but it is very much intentionally an area that we don't speak to in great detail, but believe lots of work is needed to confront those important issues. Do you want anything, David? No, that's great. Perfect. Um, well, I have another question that's actually directed specifically at Danny. Uh, so forgive me for, for hitting you twice, but uh, it's, it's a question from Huan, uh, who says, um, uh, Danny, you said you know a lot of people working on technology solutions. Do you think technology, uh, for instance, carbon sequestration, can save us? No. Um, and I want to be clear, I think David and I are both people who think that a lot of the climate problem is going to require much more innovation than we currently have. But this is kind of like a, a more advanced level position. The most important thing to say is there's a lot of things we can do right now with the technologies we have. There's a huge part of this puzzle that is deployment, and there's a huge part of this puzzle that's innovation. We've been really focused on uh, the innovation part of this in the politics of this book, because we think that's where a lot of the biggest challenges are. Um, so new technologies are going to be a key part of this, but there are, there are no silver bullets. And I think it's really important for people who are sort of thinking big picture, where do I put my efforts? The answer should be everywhere. Pick whatever interests you most, but not to the exclusion of the other parts of the problem, because this is bigger than any of us. Um, and when we talk about innovation as a you know key focus, it's because we already understand that there's a big deployment challenge and feel like there's a lot of momentum on the deployment side and there's a lot of stuck thinking on the innovation side. Um, so again, great to work in that area, just it's not the only game in town. Terrific. Um, David, I'll, I'll ask this one uh, of you then. Um, this is a question from, from Jillian uh, Kelly. And by the way, I should say, you know, the, the floor is still open for more questions. So by all means, uh, um, contribute them. Uh, so, from, uh, so Jillian asks, the conservative climate group uh, Republican describes regulation as not effective, saying it would move manufacturing to other un unregulated countries, uh, incentives as insufficient, and a carbon tax as the only, quote, sensible answer. Uh, and she says, you know, if I'm understanding you correctly that some combination of carbon tax plus regulation would work best, could you distill a way of countering the tax only argument? And I'm particularly uh, interested in, in your thoughts, David, because you're such a great communicator of kind of complicated ideas into sort of policy language that, that, that people can understand. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if I will succeed in this area. This is a complicated question. It's a good question. I don't know, for caveat, I don't know Republican. I, I feel like carbon tax enthusiast groups are now coming out of the woodwork. It's the new, new thing uh, to, to do when you're interested in markets and interested in, in looking like you're solving the climate problem. I would say, show me the evidence. This is a kind of political whack-a-mole that's going on. You got a problem and then the first, the only thing that can fix it is cap and trade. So we try that waxman marking and so on. And then we hit the mole, we whack the mole and then something else pops up. And now we're doing whack-a-mole with carbon taxes, the favorite idea, partly organized by one of my mentors for whom I have an enormous amount of respect, uh, just passed away, George Schultz, uh, is carbon tax with, with the dividend. Uh, so give the money back to everybody, Alaska style. And I just think that that whole community has not, has failed on, on two fronts. 
The first front is to look at the actual real world experience with these instruments, which is like Norway, where you have high taxes and then all kinds of other things that actually get get the work the, the work done. And the other thing is, to, is they failed to think like political scientists. And that's partly a failure of our discipline to help them, but they failed to think about how in the real world, not an imaginary world, but how in the real world do you actually put the system in place and hold it in place? So for example, if you think that just handing all the money back to everybody as a check is going to buy political support, let's go test the idea. People have gone off and tested similar ideas, a little hard to parse the evidence because we haven't done it at scale. And most of the testing is not supportive of that idea. And it's politically very, very expensive to just hand all the money back. And so I just think that that level of political granularity has been missing from these debates that think the problem can be solved with a really simple instrument when the real world problems like this require complex interventions in the economy. And, and that's what we're talking about. I, I prefer to live in the real world as opposed to the imaginary world but I appreciate that imagination is a fun place to be sometimes. Let me just add, I started in climate science. I'm not a climate scientist anymore, but my roots are in earth sciences. Um, and, and I think we lose something in these policy discussions that the scientific community understands um, much better. And that is you have to get to net zero to slow the rate of warming. There's just no other answer. You don't get to fudge your way to anything less than then no net increase in atmospheric concentrations of CO2. And then you have lags as the system continues to warm. We had a lot of problems to deal with, but the science is really clear. You got to go to zero. You got to go to net zero. And in, in policy and political and econ land, we talk about numbers and prices and strategies, but we often lose sight of the fact that you have to get to zero. And without disparaging my colleagues in economics, nobody can tell you what price does that or what price trajectory does that. We're going to get it wrong. Um, which isn't to say we shouldn't do it, just we're not going to get it perfect. When you have a tax, a price that applies to everybody as the single instrument of change, you are saying, let us have a discussion with every single impacted constituency, including extremely well-organized industries that will fight everything tooth and nail. Let's fight all of them at the same time, and then we're going to get it wrong, and we're going to have to do that fight all over again, time after time after time. And that is politically the sort of opposite path you would take. And if you talk to any advocate who works on these kinds of issues, they say, let me go fix heat pumps and buildings. Let me go fix EV charging infrastructure. Those are all massive problems. Like that's, that's a career to fix any one of those things. But when I'm trying to fix heat pumps and buildings, I'm not also fighting the American Petroleum Institute on transportation fuel policy. And that is just politics 101 that anyone in that mix will, will understand intuitively. And in these ideological conversations around you know, carbon prices, we often lose sight of that when the, the science is very clear, you have to go to zero. You don't just get to say it was close enough, it was ideologically convenient. Um, and that's why that political fight is so difficult. You're gonna have to renegotiate all of the time. Great. Uh, well, our question queue is, is filling up again. So let me just uh, turn to Julia Benz, uh, who's uh, another uh, one of my students here at Brown. And um, she's asking, do you think it's feasible to leverage oil and gas money and expertise to inspire innovation in renewables? What is their role in future innovation? Should they just clean up their own industry? Um, maybe I'll talk briefly about that. Um, this we released a week ago, exactly, uh, this white paper engine number one did that I wrote in association with them. And there's a whole paper, the paper that works through exactly this question of if you're in, if you're in the incumbent industry and you're in a high car, higher carbon industry and you're facing now credible need to change, what do you do? And there's a whole bunch of different answers. And I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that question. And, and that's crucial because it means that as a matter of corporate strategy, what you need to do is work on a lot of fronts and figure out what you're good at, work solutions, figure out how to scale them up. Companies that aren't doing that are companies that are then going to be really far behind when it comes to actually making reductions in emissions. My guess is a lot of that industry is going to just shut down. Uh, that they should give the capital back to shareholders. You know, there's, there's less, the, the money, the question implies there's a huge amount of money sitting there. Uh, newsflash, especially over the last year, a whole lot less money, a whole lot less capital. You look at this in the capital budgets, which have gone down by a third or so in, over the last year. I think there are a few areas where they might have a role to play in renewables. So offshore wind, for example, you see Shell, BP, a few others leveraging expertise in platforms, uh, especially floating platforms for, for uh, offshore wind. That's interesting, potentially valuable. 
There's some other systems integration areas where the renewables might, they might play a role. These could end up being hydrogen companies. Um, uh, they could end up playing a big role in CCS. The scaling has been, been hard. So that's less of a renewables issue. Hydrogen might be a renewables issue. Um, if you use hydrogen integrated with renewables, that looks very expensive right now, but maybe that'll scale. So I think they're just kind of experimenting and looking at a, at a lot of different, uh, a, a lot of different options. And it's the unknowns there. If I were on the board of one of these companies, it's, it's, it's exploring the unknowns that I would be much more attentive to than pretending like we know what the actual solution is. Just a quick plug for geothermal. I think that's another area where the skill sets of reservoir engineering are extremely yeah. relevant. Yeah, and there's a lot of really interesting innovation there. You know, now that people are focusing on this uh, ultra deep drilling, uh, integrity of materials for deep geothermal and so on, that's what yeah, I agree with you. Right. Well, I think we have uh, time for just maybe one more. Uh, and so I'll take Han Lin's question. Uh, she says, thank you for the discussion. The European Union, Japan, and China have all published guidelines and taxonomy regarding climate change and green finance. So how applicable are these guidelines uh, to the US? And will the US be more market oriented instead of policy driven? Uh, I, I, I ask you to sort of pull that apart if you can. Uh, and so help us think about green finance. So David, I, I love your take. I get really confused when people talk about green finance and climate finance, because I, I can't tell what it is people are often talking about when they say that. It, it's sort of a, a catch-all term. And it's true, there have been some really important standards that governments have articulated and that private firms have articulated about what sort of bumpers they're going to put on their investment portfolio. And the fact is a lot of people are divesting from some individual subsectors. Coal is the most popular sector where large institutional investors or governments say maybe we shouldn't put money into coal with the important exception of China's Belt and Road Initiative where coal is, continues to be a real prominent topic. Um, coal is an easy one to get out of because there's not a lot of growth in coal. And so you're seeing in some, some respects, the climate finance discussion sort of match market reality without really changing a whole lot. Um, I'm trying to keep an open mind about all this because I, I do think that serious efforts in this world can make a difference, but I'm, I'm looking for signs that there's something more than noise. And I'm personally having some trouble seeing a lot of that right now, but David, I think is closer to some of those discussions and may have more. Well, I mean, being close is actually often unhelpful because you get, you get attracted to the latest shiny object. And I think green, uh, green finance is a shiny object. I think what I care about is finance. <laughs> and, and um, less the color of the money and more, I mean, there's a role to be played for climate specific funds and some of those, but when you take a step back, it's the tens of trillions of dollars that's flowing through the capital markets that we're trying to alter. And, and that's gonna be done by changing the expectations around finance. And we see some examples of this, Danny mentioned coal. Um, you know, the only places where coal is kind of hanging on is shielded behind state-owned enterprises and a variety of other places where the normal capital instruments don't really, don't, don't really apply. Um, I, I think the standards that, that governments are setting are premature. I think they're pretending that they know what they want from finance when in reality, we don't know what we want from finance. And one of the places where I've seen this in particular has to do with disclosure standards, where there's been a lot of attention to disclosure around what are called transition risks so from high carbon industries to lower carbon industries. And that has a role to play. My take on the literature though, is that the really big exposures in the capital markets have to do with physical risks of climate change. So take, for example, the municipal debt market in the United States, is this, there's no relationship as far as, far as we've done a huge study on this at Brookings, there's no relationship between the ex physical exposure of these different municipalities to climate impacts like wildfires and heat stress and so on, and what they tell the market when they go raise, when they go raise money. That's a concern. And I think that's actually an area where the US is changing very, very rapidly. The shift in Washington has been helpful to this. The SEC is ready to change. The Fed, uh, in terms of market supervision and stress tests and so on, is already making noises along these, these lines. And, and so this for us in the United States is very important because we have a big credibility problem with the rest of the world and that people don't know whether to believe what we say in Washington because they don't know if it's just gonna change with the next administration. This is an area where you change the rules and expectations in the capital markets, capital redirects, and that's not gonna change even if you know, uh, somebody else takes over the White House and we have a change in, in 27 executive orders. So I, I think that's that, that kind of topic is gonna to be very, very important, not just because it's gonna alter the flow of tens of trillions of dollars, but also because it's gonna boost the credibility of what the country does.
Uh, well, thank you so much for those thoughts. I wish we had more time uh, because that, especially that last question, I think opens up you know a whole uh, another discussion. I would love to uh, dive into it because uh, you're absolutely right. The trillions of dollars are at stake here, and there's a, a big question about how much is greenwashing versus how much is uh, seems to be making. Um, uh, some differences around the edges, at least. And uh, I, I came at th this uh, whole thing from a very skeptical perspective, but the last year has been really interesting uh, watching all of the different initiatives that are happening across finance from central banks to divestment to you know accounting standards and the whole bit. So it's a really fascinating space right now. And it, 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 uh, its ultimate effect will be uh, interesting to, to track. But of course, uh, that would be at least another hour and maybe you know, three more days of discussion if we wanted to dive into that. So uh, instead, what I uh, want to say uh, is first and foremost, go buy the book because uh, this is just a fascinating, provocative, well-researched, well-developed uh, uh, argument by uh, two authors who really uh, understand the space uh, and encourage you to think about it. The other thing I will do, um, is just before we leave, I want to encourage all of our participants uh, to engage with the Climate Solutions Lab. Uh, you can sign up on our website, uh, watson.brown.edu slash climate solutions lab, all one word, uh, to receive our emails that announce events and publications and more. And if you are a college instructor, if we have any of those uh, on the, the, the line, um, you'll want to check out the Climate Solution, uh, sorry, the Climate Syllabus Bank, uh, which provides free downloadable syllabi from around the world uh, to make it easier for those of us who, which was me until uh, a year ago, uh, haven't taught a climate uh, uh, politics class or climate change class for the social sciences and are a little intimidating about putting, about putting uh, a syllabus together, uh, you can go to this syllabus bank and learn what others uh, have done from around uh, the world. Uh, and so, uh, please take advantage of that resource. Let me end by just uh, thanking uh, uh, Amanda and Danny and David for their really useful discussion today uh, and wish uh, the authors all uh, uh, the, the best of luck uh, with um, having the best impact with this book. Well, many thanks to you for the invitation. Really terrific to be with you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Amanda and Jeff and also Ellen. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks very much, Jeff, for organizing this. It was great, very stimulating. Terrific. Well, thanks so much. Uh, and we'll uh, hope to see you all soon and maybe even in person in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Take care.